And uh, I don't know about you, but chapter 10 is one of those fascinating chapters that we can find in the Bible. And uh, some of you might be raising an eyebrow and saying, well, how can it be one of the most fascinating? It's just, you know, a bunch of genealogies as you go through the, but, you know, as it's been titled by different commentators of the Bible, uh, you know, it's the genealogy of the nations. And the reason it can say that, of course, is that this is the breakdown of humanity after the flood. And so what happened, of course, during the flood is that all of humanity, you know, from, of course, Adam and Eve came along, they expanded to millions and probably billions by the time the flood came. And then the flood reduced mankind down to eight again. So one family, okay, a husband, her, his wife, and then, of course, his three sons and, and daughter-in-laws. So uh, just a small capsule of one family again to repopulate the entire earth and so of course from that family came all the nations of the earth and uh, and so chapter 10 is fascinating because when we look at it we find that God there really is and it's also instrumental because it really reveals there uh, God is revealing of course through Moses that the that the devil was very busy after the flood and after that flood he began to lay some very important foundations for his strategies in regards to a lot of the key peoples a lot of the key cities uh, that we find uh, some of them even where we know they are today uh, of all the ancient cities that we went through in Genesis chapter 10 and uh, uh, notorious cities famous cities through the centuries and through the Old Testament era um, and sometimes some of them even into the New Testament era for a time uh, as enemies of God, notorious enemies of God and of God's people. Uh, what are the two of them all that we discovered last week that we know where their location is today? This is your kind of review, your quiz from last week and a little bit of trivia. Nineveh, yes. Okay, so Nineveh is in the country of, the modern country of Iraq. And so it's in the very north of Iraq. It's almost in Turkey, but it's not quite in. So Mo Mosul, or M-O-S-U-L, Mosul, in, uh, in, in I modern Iraq is uh, just south of where Nineveh is. So the tell, as the archaeologists call it, T-E-L, and that is kind of a dig or a mound where they have discovered an ancient city of some kind. So we have the tell of Nineveh uh, in Iraq. What's the other one? Pardon me? Babylon, that's right. And where's that one located? What country? Iraq, Iraq as well. So it's just kind of trivial. Uh, it, you know, the fact that both of the cities, the ancient notorious cities that were developed in the very first uh, years after the flood uh, are two locations where we know where they are and they both are in the country of Iraq. And uh, so we have this rebellion against God through the descendants, uh, for the most part, most of the descendants of Ham make up uh, those rebellious peoples and, and cities. And so, uh, of course, the, the key grandson of Ham was Nimrod, wasn't he? And uh, Nimrod, of course, was the kingpin that uh, kind of led this rebellious movement against God and established Babel, established Nineveh, established some of these cities and, and, and peoples, again, that... Uh, we're really against God and his people for centuries uh, to come. We have Canaan. We have uh, Babel, which later became Babylon. Uh, we have Nineveh. Of course, we talked about the Philistines are mentioned. We also have the city of Sidon on the coastline of the Mediterranean. And, uh, and then, of course, we have the other brother of Ham, which is Japheth. And uh, Japheth's lineage, when you look at it, is pretty clean, isn't it? There's only one kind of blemish there, and it actually is quite a significant one because even Revelation picks up on it when it talks about the last rebellion against God in the last years of Earth's history. It, it prophesies about Gog and Magog. And, uh, and Magog is one of the grandsons or great-grandsons, et cetera, of um, Ham's brother, Japheth. And so Japheth has a pretty clean lineage compared to Ham by far, but he did, uh, he did produce a Magog, which really went sideways and went uh, against God in a very serious way. And then we come to the third brother, and his name was? Shem. Okay. Now, Shem is very similar in his history and in his faithfulness, and therefore in his lineage, as a result of that, the fruit of his lineage, uh, very faithful and very similar to Seth. And so we have two... Uh, men that both have very similar names. We have Seth and we have Shem. Now, of course, Seth was 
the third uh, um, son of Adam and Eve. And then uh, Seth, of course, when you follow his lineage, these were the sons of God, and it led all the way to that instrumental figure just before the flood named Noah. And so the lineage of Seth was instrumental in bringing us uh, to Noah, and God paints that out for us in the first chapters of, of Genesis. And then Shem leads us to another instrumental man of faith and in God's plan of salvation, and that is Abraham. Yeah, that's right. So another huge figure in God's plan and in history. And so the last half of Revelation, or not Revelation, but uh, a Genesis chapter 11 is where God moves us uh, now from a rebellious works of Satan. Again, chapter 10 kind of reveals the foundation of Satan's works and his peoples and his cities and so on. But then as we come to the last half of chapter 11, which is where we're picking up today, uh, it moves us from the rebellious works of Satan to the works and strategies of God. And, uh, and it always reminds me every time I come to this, uh, it reminds me of, of Genesis chapter 13 and 14. Because when we go to the last book of the Bible, we find that uh, in Genesis 13, God reveals the strategies of the evil one. Talks about the beast and then the second beast that rises up and causes the whole world to wonder and worship after the first beast and the image of the first beast and, and great persecution breaks out and so on. So we have the strategies of the devil, but then the next chapter, God transitions and reveals what God is going to be up to in the last years of earth's history. And so we have the faithful, the 144,000. We have those who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They have the faith of Jesus and keep the commandments of God. And uh, so they're described much different, aren't they? They're the ones with the three angels' message that, uh, that God brings to the world at the same time that the devil is busy bringing his strategy uh, to work as revealed in chapter 13. So I think there's some real parallel uh, between Genesis, uh, the 10th chapter, and Genesis, the 11th uh, chapter. So let's go to Genesis chapter 11. We'll pick it up with verse 10. I'm just going to go ahead and read right through to verse 26. And so you can quietly follow along with me. So we're picking it up where we left off last week uh, in chapter 11. And now verse 10, it says, This is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begot, begat Arphaxad uh, two years after the flood. So two years after the flood had reset, receded and such... Um, he and his family, Shem and his family, uh, went ahead and began to produce a family. In verse 11, it says, After he begot Ar Arphax Ar Arphaxad, uh, Shem lived 500 years and begot sons and daughters. Arphaxad lived 35 years and begot Salah. After he begot Salah, Arphaxad lived 403 years and begot sons and daughters. Uh, Selah lived 30 years and begot Eber. And after Eber, Selah lived 403 years and begot sons and daughters. Then Eber lived 34 years and begot Peleg. And uh, after he begot Peleg, Eber lived 430 years and begot sons and daughters. Peleg lived 30 years and begot Ru. After he begot Ru, Peleg lived 209 years and begot sons and daughters. Uh, Ru lived 30 years, 32 years. Uh, oh, did I just read that? No. Verse 20 years is where we're at? Uh, see, that's what happens when I look up. Uh, Ru lived 32 years and begot Sarek. And after he begot Sarek, Ru lived 207 years and begot sons and daughters. Sarek lived 30 years and begot Nahor. And after he begot Nahor, Sarek lived 200 years and begot sons and daughters. Nahor lived 29 years and begot Terah. And after he begot Terah, Nahor lived 119 years and begot sons and daughters. Now Terah lived 70 years and he begot Abram. Nahor and Haran. Okay. So now we can say we've, oh no, we haven't finished chapter 11, but we've gotten a lot closer, haven't we? All right. But we don't want to rush ahead too fast because we want to stop and just talk a little bit about that section without going back in all the nitty details. Uh, but um, there's two patterns that we find here that are not in the previous genealogy. So in all the genealogies that we've studied so far, uh, from Adam and Eve all the way down in, in different parts, uh, there's, there's two differences, two new patterns that we find in this particular genealogy. What are those two new patterns? Anybody? Life is shortening. Life is shortening. Okay, the lifespan is what you're referring to, right? So people aren't living as long. Okay, good. So it went from 400 and something, 400 and something, 400 and something, and all of a sudden it went to 
All of a sudden it went to 209 years. So in 400 and something, 400 and something, 400 and something, 209. Okay, now we don't have to do very much math to realize that's about half. So all of a sudden from one generation to the next, it, it, it was chopped in half. It went from 400 approximately to approximately uh, 200. And that is um, uh, Shem's great, great grandson, Peleg. And he lives 209 years. And uh, so Peleg is the first man on record not to reach the 400 year mark. And uh, we find that in verse 19 as we've already read. And so I, you can only imagine, you know, how the family must have reacted to that, responded. Now it doesn't say, of course, how he died. Maybe I can't say he got hit by a bus. Maybe he got hit by a chariot or, or you know, or something to that effect. But, um, you know, we don't know how he died. But, of course, if we look at the other lives that follow after that, it's all 200 or less after that, isn't it? All approximately 200 and under. And, uh, and so we see a general pattern there. So most likely he died from natural death. Um, but nevertheless, we have enough evidence of the lives that happened afterwards that the lifespan was dramatically reducing. And, uh, and then we come to Nahor, which is Abram, Abraham's grandpa. So Nahor is 148 years old when he dies. So if you put the verses together and add up the math of when he had his first son and then when he died, um, it comes to 148 years. And so again, you know, the families must have been horrified. He didn't even make it to 300, yet alone 400. You know, all of our grandpas and my dad lived to 400 and all of a sudden, you know, uh, poor Peglick, he's, he's buried at 209. And of course, it still seems tremendous from our perspective in our life span that we deal with today. But for them, it must have been quite dramatic and hard to wrap their minds around the fact that, you know, that we're only going to live 200 years now instead of 400. Um, half. Kept getting sad. It would be, yeah, I would imagine, yeah. So it must have been hard for those first generations to, to kind of deal uh, with that. Now, there's all kinds of different theories that, that come with why the, the lifespans were decreasing and there's a number of things of course sin in itself you know the consequences of sin has been deteriorating the DNA pool um, ever since Adam and Eve first sinned so that's that's a big factor that continues to play out and so even 400 is not very big compared to you know the first generations after the flood compared to Noah and his dis, you know his um, ancestors who lived you know 600 years was young you know you live seven eight nine hundred years before you start to uh, get ready for your funeral. So, so of, of course, uh, that's a big factor. The other factor is that the, the world is not nearly as, 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 what did you say, conducive. It's not r nearly as pleasant. It's not nearly as life-giving as it used to be before the flood. Because before the flood, you know, the, the air was probably richer with oxygen. There was, you know, everything was more beautiful and the quality of life and the quality of nature and the quality of the food and everything um, w was better before the flood, even in spite of sin. And so that must have been a factor as well. Yes? Yeah, I would say it was probably like a giant hyperbaric chain. Yeah. yeah. Before. Mm -hmm. Perfect condition. That's right. Before, before the flood, yeah. And that's the right. That's right. And then if... 500 years old when he had his three sons. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So Mark is pointing out that there is the, 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 the atmosphere was al almost for certain was, was better. So the air we breathed, the food we ate, the accessibility to the food that we had, uh, everything was better. And so the earth was cursed. The ground was cursed one more time during the judgment flood. And uh, so because of that, uh, we immediately started to pay the consequences. Um, also, some have suggested that meat eating also um, started to uh, take its effect as well. And so we were eating more or meat for the first time for different families and generations and so on. And uh, even though it wasn't the perfect diet and God doesn't condemn clean meat, it's still very, very clear that it's, we're healthier, we live longer without eating meat. And uh, so that's, that's very likely um, part of it as well. So there's a number of different factors that make sense of why the, the lifespans started to shrink dramatically after the flood. But uh, it's very obvious as we read this important genealogy. What's the other pattern? Okay. All right. 
Yeah, I mean, I have a feeling that was probably pretty rampant before the flood too because remember the whole world was full of wickedness and so on. So that was still taking a, a toll though, wasn't it? Because alcohol is proven to, to shorten our lifespan. Yeah, yeah, it makes us much more prone to disease, uh, you know, uh, mortal diseases like uh, um, fatal diseases is what the word I'm looking for. Yeah. So what's the other, what's the other, um, what's the other pattern that's new to this genealogy of Shem that we just read? Ah, good. Thank you, Ken. Okay, so Ken has pointed out that they're having their children earlier. And, uh, and so that's very obvious there as well, isn't it? Okay, before they would take their time. I mean, Noah was the slowest. You know, he didn't start to have children until he was 500, you know. So, but we don't know when he got married. He doesn't say, but finally he said, honey, maybe we should have some kids. Well, we've been married a couple hundred years. Sure, you know, I'm ready for a change. <laughs> <laughs> it's all perspective, really, isn't it? I mean, when you live 900 years and you get married till you're 300, well, you still got 600 years. That's a lot of anniversary still. Uh, <laughs> what did you call your anniversary when you got to 100 and then 200 and then 300, you know? We've been married for 350 years. I mean, that was real, right? For the faithful ones. Yeah, that's right. You didn't run out of precious gems. What do you do after diamond? Yeah. Children, which probably did something to the uh, genetic factor of, of children. Yeah, that could be. So you're suggesting that's part of the lifespan shrinkage? Is that, you know, the reduction of the lifespan? Yeah. So Sue is suggesting here in our class that uh, perhaps the intermarrying w too close to the family and sharing the same G DNA pool uh, was starting to take some negative effects. And that's possible. Um, yeah, never thought of that one. Yeah, so they got married and they began to have children a lot younger, didn't they? Like, more like today, really. Because they were like, you know, in their 20s, 30s, um, and they get married and start a family and so on. Um, so it's interesting the way that worked. And maybe that's why their life spent. That was the other theory I had. Maybe it's because they started childbearing so much earlier that they started to age faster. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I've, I, I know by experience that, you know, there's a sacrifice. There's, there's a, there, I mean, I love my children. I got one of them in the audience, so I better be careful here. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, I would never trade them for the world or do it all over any different. But, um, but I mean, it takes, it, it takes its toll, doesn't it? So, I don't know. That's just an extra theory I have. Maybe it's one of the factors, but it'd be way down under the other ones. Yes, Mark? Mm -hmm. You know, rain and all that, and I don't know how that would, some way that would affect the lifespan possibly. I mean, okay. Climate, yeah. Climate, uh, the extremes in the climate. So, Mark here is suggesting that perhaps the lifespan was also decreased because, of course, all negative stress uh, takes its toll on us, doesn't it? So, when you see somebody that, that's led a very harsh lifestyle, they made some very harsh lifestyle, you know, they're driving around in a Harley that you can, you know, hear from three miles away and, and, and they're smoking drugs and they're doing, you know, staying up all night and partying and all, that. you know, they, you see somebody that's 40 years old and they look 60, you know, so we don't even have to do research to know that that environment does age you faster. And, uh, and so, Mark, I think you're onto something there. The fact that we had extremes in, in temperatures and seasons and rain and, and some of this other negative stress that uh, that came that uh, added to to our aging faster yes mark yeah right right so mark is saying in seattle and uh, vancouver and canada same thing you know you got this gloomy kind of uh, long stretches of gloomy, socked in rain and so on, and so people get more depressed and, and, and suicide rate goes up. Um, yeah. Back yeah. <laughs> That's right, Walter. Well, we don't want to get, we don't want to park here too long. <laughs> and and uh, your, uh, diet. you guys are so smart, you know, we could spend the whole 50 minutes just talking about <laughs> all the factors that shorten our lifespan. You guys are good. Well, you guys are good. One we missed, though. Yes. Uh-oh. God cut it short. God cut it short. Oh. How oh. he did it, I don't 
Okay. Well, I don't know if we have record for that, and that brings up a misunderstood, a misunderstood verse. Now, I never covered that. I think maybe Pastor Doug or Pastor Jean, I forget which now. But let's go back. I think it was Pastor Doug, but in Genesis 6, verse 3, um, there's a common misunderstanding by a lot of sincere Christians uh, when they read when God first starts a conversation with Noah and, uh, and, and, um, and is making a decision to, uh, to, to cut uh, the... the the population of the of the planet down dramatically uh, because of its sinful choices. But uh, we have God uh, saying that my spirit not sh- will, shall not strive with men forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. And so, some of some of us have mis- sin- sincerely misunderstood that and, and has interpreted that to mean that God put a cap from that day forward and said that man will never live more than one hundred and twenty years. And, uh, and, but of course the genealogy that we just read from Shem um, kind of uh, throws a lot of water on that idea and the reason being is that when you find the generations that follow after Noah and after the flood uh, we find that they were still living 400 years for several generations and then 200 years and, uh, and even Nahor the, 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 the father of Terah uh, lived 148 years so we have a several generations that live far beyond 120 years after that statement that God made. And uh, so we know we can't interpret it that way, but if we look at the context of verse 3, and again, this is review again, uh, you know, it says, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. And so really, the context here is that God is looking and he sees the deterioration of the morality and spirituality of mankind, and it's going down so fast that he says, listen, probation is going to be up in 120 years from that day forward. In other words, you know, he's gonna, he's, he's, his hand is forced to bring this judgment upon the world. And so he brings the, the flood upon the world. Um, so from the time that he has that conversation in Genesis 6, 120 years probation closes, the, arc of the, the door of the ark closes, and, uh, and of course the flood takes place. Yeah. Okay, so another couple of interesting things. Now the flood takes place approximately 2,500 years. Now we're talking ballpark figures here, okay? So the flood takes place about 2,500 years. And, uh, and again, reflecting on Shem's genealogy, we find here that uh, Jem, Shem and his wife start a family, and so they have Arphaxad, their first son, two years after the flood is over. And then 35 years later, we find that their, uh, Arphaxad has his son, and Salah, and when you add up all those different lifespans or different time spans between the birth of each generation, it comes to uh, 292 years before you get to Abraham. So there's eight generations between Shem and, uh, uh, including Shem, uh, there's eight generations until you get to Abraham, and that is a span of, well, it's 292 years. And, uh, and and so then we come to that key figure of Abraham, and uh, and by the way, uh, when you get to Peleg, and we mentioned that in our study in chapter ten, uh, Peleg was the great 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 grandson of uh, Shem, and uh, and and that's if we look at verse. Uh, chapter 10 verse 25 we had that intriguing verse where it says uh, when Peleg was born and it was in his days that the earth was divided so when Peleg came into this world that was the same time that God stymied the languages of of the project of the Tower of Babel and of mankind and then mankind was scattered upon the earth according to the different languages and uh, and so when we put together Peleg and the precise time spans that it gives us in the second genealogy of Shem, by the way. And genealogy of Shem, this is the second time, isn't it? Because the last several verses of chapter 10 was a genealogy of Shem as well. Um, But the reason that God goes back and revisits only Shem and his genealogy is for two reasons. Number one, because it was Shem's lineage that led us to Abraham. And that's a key to the plan of salvation, isn't it? And uh, the second reason is because God gives us those key figures or time spans that took place between each generation. When one was born 35 years later, the next generation had their firstborn son, and then 29 years later. When you add those all up, you can do some fun and interesting and helpful math. And uh, so then I started to think to myself, well, if that's true, if we know where Peleg was born um, compared to when Shem came off the boat, and, uh, and of course, uh, Shem has firstborn, 
two years after the flood, two years after he got off the boat. How long was it between the time that the family got off the boat and the Tower of Babel took place and, uh, and, and the confusion of languages? And so when you add up the first one, two, three, four generations to Pelech, it comes to 101 years. So now we can know for certain that the Bible reveals to us that it was 100 years before we come to the Tower of Babel and the confusion of our languages. So anyway, just some interesting um, uh, working with numbers that I've never done before that I did preparing for tonight. All right. Well, with that being said, uh, we come to, uh, of course, that key figure, Abraham. And, uh, and by the way, Shem lived 200 years after Abraham was born. So Shem, one of the ones that lived before the flood, helped build the boat, got on the boat, went through the flood for a year, came off the boat. He was there firsthand, and, and we have the potential uh, for Shem to have, he had 200 years to go over and find his great, 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 great nephew, or whatever you want to call it, um, and share with him firsthand, verbally, exactly what happened before the flood, during the flood, and after the flood. Isn't that fascinating? You know, so, you know, for the faithful, uh, we find that um, there was amazing overlap for centuries for some. And of course, Noah was still around, as, as Pastor Doug pointed out last week as well. And so we have Noah and Shem, two faithful men that remained faithful to death as far as the Bible record goes. And they both could have given Abraham and his family firsthand accounts of not only what happened historically, but of God's law. God's will, his plan of righteousness, his promise of the Messiah, all of that would have been verbally passed on uh, to these different families. And uh, yes, Rob. There's speculation that um, Melchizedek should have been Okay, and I think Pastor Doug was leading to that last week, if I, I, I remember. I'm not sure if we got that far, and, 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 or maybe it was Pastor Ross this last Sabbath during, I forget now, during his sermon or something, you know, you get confused as all this information comes, but I think maybe it was a sermon on Sabbath, but uh, yeah, so Rob is saying that there's speculation that uh, Melchizedek, the priest that came to Abraham after Abraham and his, and his militia had rescued his uh, lot and his, his family, um, that they were, uh, that that was Shem, that that was Shem, yeah. So Shem's name would have been changed to Melchizedek, and I don't have done a word study on Melchizedek, so I don't know if we have some insight on, on what that word, that name means, and why Shem's name would have been changed to that. But that potential is there because of these massive overlaps uh, that 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 took place. There's also speculation that, that Melchizedek was Jesus Christ. Well, Melchiz well, we know for sure he wasn't. Mel we know for sure Melchizedek wasn't Jesus. Uh, but we do know for sure that he was Melchizedek. God used Melchizedek as a symbol for Jesus because Paul, the apostle in the book of Hebrews, does point that out and, uh, and says that Melchizedek was a real priest that was a real priest of the, of, the, of the God Most High. He lived in where is now called Jerusalem, God's holy city. Um, but because we don't, the Bible doesn't record who the parents of Melchizedek are, when he was born, where he went after he encountered Abraham. And so that mysteriousness, that, that unknown was used by God to symbolize the fact that Christ came. And of course, he came mysteriously, conceived by the Holy Spirit, didn't have an earthly father um, and, uh, and, and such. And so there's that, there's that deep symbolism that God used. Yeah, he was a deep type of Christ. Yeah, a symbol of Christ. Okay, any other comments or questions on Shem and his descendancy, his genealogy? Because now we're coming to verse 26 to Terah, and Terah is no small figure. He's the dad of Abraham. And when he's 70 years old, he begins a, a family, and he has three sons. And it appears that Abraham is the firstborn, the oldest of the three. And, uh, and then we read verse 27. It says, this is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And then Haran begot Lot. So he had a son named Lot. He would be a he would be a, a, a nephew of Abram, and uh, and then Haran in verse twenty eight died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans, and so clearly Haran uh, died prematurely, and and this context here points more to a not a natural death, uh, but 
or rather instead it would be either by disease or accident or, or something tragic like that. And uh, so Haran has passed on even before his dad and his brothers, of course. And then in verse 29, it says, um, then Abram and Nahor took wives. And the name of Abram's wife was Sarai. And we don't want to get confused here. Sometimes we come to Abram and Sarai. And if you've ever, this is the first time studying through Genesis, of, of course, um, you know, you say, well, I thought it was Abraham. It sounds almost like Abraham. It sounds almost like Sarah, but it's not. And uh, just hold tight. We're going to get to that answer. But both of their names were changed. And it's interesting that both were changed to names that were very similar to their original names, but they have different meanings. And, um, and so you'll find that out. In fact, my margin here, oh, yeah, it's just pointing to Sarah. So when you read Sarah, if you go to the margin of my Bible, it says Sarah, just to clarify, it's the same figure. So the name of Abraham's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Is Iscah. And uh, who does that make Milcah then? Nahor is marrying within the family, isn't he? Because he marries Milcah, and Milcah is Nahor's niece. Okay, now nowadays we kind of get uncomfortable we kind of <laughs> shudder a little bit and we think well that's kind of creepy <laughs> you know but uh today it should be because from Moses' day on which is about uh i don't know uh 1500 years later um no let me see now 2500 years and then we go to 50, no about a thousand years later uh we find that god says okay uh listen we've got to stop marrying within the family because the dna the genetic pool just can't can't safely handle that anymore. But before that, that was, and this gives credence to the answer that many of us ask um, in regards to Adam and Eve, is that if there's only a man and a woman that started all humanity, then who do their kids marry? Well, they married their sisters and their brothers. Um, now again, that's creepy, and it should be, because God has forbidden it since the days of Moses. But back then, the genetic pool was so pure that it wasn't creepy. It was, it was permissible, and it was fine. It was part of God's plan. And it would have been even before sin because, again, he only started with one man, one woman. And he said, go and multiply and be fruitful and fill the earth. And so even if sin hadn't come, that was still part of God's plan. But because of sin, our DNA and our genetic pool has, has degraded to the point where it started to become uh, uh, physically and, and genetically dangerous and, and unhealthy. And so now it seems kind of weird, but back then that was un not unweird. Uh, Abraham's sister or half-sister was Sarah. They shared the same dad, but not the same mother. And so that's how uh, Abraham kind of convinced himself to not be so honest with the king in Egypt and, and said, she's actually my sister, not my wife. Um, but it turns out she was both. All right, so where were we? Uh, oh, we were talking about verse 29. That's right. Okay, so we're looking at a bit of a, now God is really zeroing in. He's giving way more details than the other generations, isn't he? And then he says in verse 30, but Sarai was barren. She had no child. And so it points out that there was a challenge within Abraham's um, family and marriage. In verse 31, it says, and Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abraham, Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now, is Haran in the promised land? No, it's not in Canaan, is it? It's just north of Canaan. So they came from the east. You've got to have the map backwards. I hope I'm going the right direction. But if you're, this is the east, maybe it should be over here for you. Yeah, that's right. So this will be right for you. All right. So if you're in the east over in Mesopotamia, where Ur was in the Chaldeans, that's where Babylon, the, you know, the neighborhood of Babylon. Uh, and then you came kind of follow the, is it Tiger? No, the Euphrates River. Of course, they traveled near the rivers because otherwise it was desert land and he wouldn't survive very long. So they followed the fertile plains of the river. And so they would follow the, the Euphrates until they came to Haran, which was pretty well straight north of the, of the um, promised land. And so the goal was to get to Canaan, but they only made it as far as Haran before they kind of stopped and camped there for a while. And 
and, uh, and, and set up shop for a while until Tara died, uh, Abram's dad. Now, when I first read this, you know, I was trying to put the pieces together and, and so on. It almost sounds like when you read verse 31 that it was Tara that really was leading the way here originally is getting as far as Haran because it says Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot and the daughter-in-law and so on and the whole family kind of packed up and went to Haran. But it does say they went out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan and so their goal was Canaan but uh, they only made it as far as Haran as far as Terah goes. And so Abraham kind of capitulated to whatever measure he either felt convicted or didn't feel convicted to stay in Haran rather than continue on into Canaan. Um, when you come to patriarchs and prophets, and this is where you can find some clarity, I just want to read a, a paragraph there because um, it helps us put all the pieces here together. Because when you go to Hebrews in the New Testament, in chapter 11, we find there that God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans. And, uh, and he, where he went, he went by faith, and where he went, he did not know. And so in the middle of page 127, it says this, the call from heaven first came to Abraham while he dwelt in Ur of the Chaldees. And so it wasn't his dad that received the call, even while they were in their home city of Ur, it was Abraham. So the call that we later read, which is in the first verses of chapter 12, took place while they were still living in Ur. And in obedience to it, he removed, he, he removed to Haran. And so, in other words, in obedience, he moved to Haran. Thus far, his father's family accompanied him, for which their idolatry, they united the worship of the true God. Here, Abraham remained until the death of Terah. And, uh, and so, clearly, Abraham's the one that kind of convinced his dad that it was time to move. And so, his dad obviously was part of the lineage of Shem, and Shem was the purest line of far, as far as the plan of salvation and God's law. And so, it, it's natural to assume that Terah had a very, a, a fairly clear view and understanding of God's will, his plan of salvation, and, and the whole truth that God wanted them to know. Uh, problem is that they had compromised, and they had kind of buckled under the, the pressure of culture, and so they had a couple of idols in the house as well. And, uh, and so God knew that it was time for them to leave as a family first out of Ur of Chaldeans. And then when they got to Haran, Terah, and his, uh, uh, Terah dies, they bury Abram's dad. And then Nahor and his family decides to stay in Haran as well. And you can read that in the same uh, 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 excerpt here, page 127. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it was Abraham. It was God's idea. Abraham received the call, and then he obviously convinced his dad and his family, his immediate family, to, to come with him. But they only made it as far as Haran. They set up shop there. Terah dies. Haran's gone, of course, the one brother. And then we have the other brother, Nahor, stays in Haran. And only Abraham is on record of going, and his wife, Sarah. And then also the only other relative is, is Lot, which is the nephew of, of uh, Abraham's deceased brother, Haran. Have you ever wondered if Haran, that where they stopped, was it called Haran before they got there or did they call it Haran after they got there and they kind of established a city? Maybe there was a bit of a settlement there. They came along with their family and they kind of prospered for a few years and expanded the population and eventually they named it in honor of their prematurely dead son and brother, Haran. I don't know. Okay, all right, well, so you asked the same thing, yeah. Uh, I don't have enough Bible evidence or spirit of prophecy to be able to answer that, you know, uh, with certainty. Um, but I do always ask that question. I would be, I would put more of my weight on the fact that it was probably named after Abraham's deceased brother in honor of him. And so it's not unusual when Bible prophets later on will use contemporary names that they're, listeners and readers are acquainted with rather than the original names of the settlements. And so when Moses wrote this, of course, that was hundreds of years later, a thousand years later. And so Moses is referring to it as Haran because it was probably still called Haran in Moses' day. And, uh, but maybe it was called Haran by Abraham's fa uh, family. All right, and, uh, and then in chapter 12, we can look at the first couple of verses. Of course, that helps us see the full context now because we're kind of given a rundown of the of the first phase of the journey, but then God backs up now to the actual call. 
And so in chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless you, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth uh, shall be blessed. Now isn't that, that's one of the deepest covenants and promises that we can find in all the Bible. It's amazing. Now imagine if you're Abraham, you know, you're this lowly person, you know, this, this person that's not known, you're not famous by any means, you're in a compromising family, um, so your family's not outstanding in its piety and, and commitment to God. There's idols in the house. He was raised with idols as well as worship of God. Um, and yet God comes along and says, oh, by the way, I'm going to make you a great nation. Now, to be a great nation, you have to have more than one or two people, don't you? Now, what's the problem? The problem is that we read earlier on in verse 30 of the chapter before, Sarah was barren. Sarah was barren. And so Abraham, of course, would have been double shocked. I'm going to be a great nation? Well, why me? You know, first of all, little old me. And then second of all, how is that possible? Because we've been trying for years and we haven't had any success. And, uh, and so uh, we find here that, that uh, Abraham's receiving this very powerful but startling call from God. Now, Abraham could have questioned it and doubted it and been the skeptic and said, well, it's just scientifically, this is not making sense on all kinds of fronts. You know, first of all, you know, my wife is barren. You know, she's biologically incapable of having children. Or maybe he was biologically, well, we know it wasn't that later because he had, you know, just children with others. So, you know, she was biologically incapable of having children. Um, so scientifically, it didn't make sense. Uh, as far as his position in the world, it didn't make sense. As far as his family's commitment to God, it didn't make sense. But of course, the only part that really made sense was the fact that Abraham was an exception in his family. And so Abraham, regardless of the compromising decisions his family was making, said, I don't know about you and your household, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And, uh, and so that was the qualifier, wasn't it? And so we find that God knew Abraham's heart, and rather than play the skeptic and try to look at all the holes in the call that God gave to him, he said, Lord, if this is your will, it's like, you know, like Mary. Reminds me of Mary's call. You know, you shall conceive the Holy Spirit and you shall have a child. Well, wait a minute, you know, I've taken biology class in, 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 cl in school. I'd, this is not making sense. Scientifically, it doesn't make sense. But she said, your will be done. You know, as the, Lord's, as, as the Lord has called, it will be done. And so she responds in the same way that Abraham does. Is that if the Lord says it and they knew that the call was from the Lord, it was the voice of God himself. He didn't know how it was going to play out, but he responded to it, didn't he? So let's just quickly go to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. Just keep your thumb in Genesis, and as we close up for tonight, we'll quickly look at Hebrews chapter 11, the chapter of faith as God goes through the different faithful outstanding figures of the first centuries of history. He has Abel and Enoch and, and Noah and such. And then he comes to Abraham in verse 8. So Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, gives us some important insight. In Hebrews 11, verse 8, it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Now sometimes, you know, we can read into that a little bit further than perhaps God was intending for us to, to read. And in other words, you know, God, Abraham didn't wake up in the morning and say, which direction, God? He said, well, I'll go east this time. Okay, and then after a couple of miles, he said, no, take a left. And so he took a left, and he really, you know, I have a feeling he knew the general vicinity. He says, I want you to go to this land named Canaan. You don't know anything about it. You don't know who lives there or if anybody lives there. In fact, Abraham kind of assumed that nobody lived there. He said, well, God has promised this great big, you know, flourishing piece of real estate. I'm going to go there and set up shop, and we're going to reproduce and somehow miraculously have this nation of, of, of my descendants. And, uh, of course, it didn't quite work out that way. So he didn't know where he was going in regards to the fact that he really didn't know what he was getting into. Uh, but that's the great inspiration of Abraham, isn't it? That when God calls us, we go. 
whether we know anything about it or not. You know, we, as pastors, sometimes we're tempted, you know, say we get a call, we say, okay, well, what's the temperature there? What's the climate? How, you know, how, how much is the cost of living? And we go through all this checklist, right? You know, our human nature right away. But then when it comes down to it, you know, we stop and we check ourselves and say, well, you know, if God wants me in the middle of the Antarctic and he makes it clear to me that that's where he wants me, then that's where I want to be, you know, uh, because that's part of God's plan for me in his kingdom. And so that's an important part of the inspiration of, of Abraham is that God has a plan for each of us. And even though that plan may not be quite as, uh, exactly where we want it to be, um, even as it probably wasn't with Abraham, he didn't know what he was getting into. Um, and it wasn't all better roses, was it? It came with sacrifice. He had to leave his family, his closest friends, pick up his roots, his home ties, and he became a stranger in a foreign land for the rest of his life. And, uh, and so God calls us to do that sometimes. And uh, so, you know, as a pastor, and even as a non-pastor, as a church member, sometimes God might have a plan for you to be able to fulfill a certain part of his plan that is not in California. You know, Cal I was brought up in the California of Canada. And so when people would come and visit my hometown, you know, different church members, they'd meet up with me in Kelowna, BC, and they'd say, you used to live here? Why did you ever leave? You know, <laughs> and I said, well, because God called me to another place. You know, they couldn't believe that I would live the standard of living in the climate that Kelowna gives you. You know, there's a little bit longer winter, but it's the same dry, hot week after week of sunshine and, 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 and blue skies and semi-desert. And, you know, it's, it's, it really is a lot like Calif Northern California especially.